Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Future of Diplomacy Project event titled The Ukraine War and US China Competition a Southeast Asian Perspective. My name is Alan, and I am an MPA student here at the Kennedy School and the co editor in chief of the School Singapore Policy Journal. I'd like to welcome both our in person as well as virtual guests. Please be aware that the session is being recorded and that your image may appear in the recording and that we may post this video to the Dalpa Center's website. For those of you in the Zoom room, feel free to type your questions in the question and answers box. And while this event is on record, the event organizers prohibit any attendees, including journalists, from audio visual recording or distributing part or all of the event program without prior written authorization. It is my pleasure to welcome Ambassador Chan Heng Chi uh, to the Harvard Kennedy School. Ambassador Chan serves as Ambassador at Large with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Singapore and was the nation's permanent representative to the United Nations before becoming Singapore's longest serving ambassador to the US from 1996 to 2012. Madam Ambassador has had a long and distinguished career spanning diplomacy, academia, and various forms of public service. Amongst the many hats that she continues to wear, Ambassador Chan chairs the Lee Kuan Yew Center for Innovative Cities, is a board member of the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, and chairs the board of trustees of the IC's Yusuf Ishak Institute, the premier multidisciplinary research institute on Southeast Asia in the region. Ambassador Paula Dobriansky, Senior Fellow of the Future of Diplomacy Project and former U.S. Under Secretary of State for Global Affairs, will be moderating this discussion. Please join me in a warm round of applause for Ambassadors Chan and Dobriansky. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ella, uh, for that uh, warm introduction and greetings to all of you. We're very thrilled to have Ambassador Chen, Hang Chi Chen, who's here uh, with us uh, uh, today. I wanted to say uh, a personal note or give a personal note because I had the privilege when I was Under Secretary of State for Global Affairs to work with her. And the two things I want to add is, first of all, she really knows the United States well. She was before ambassador from Singapore to Washington. She was Singapore's ambassador to the United Nations. And by the way, her tenure in Washington, she also became the dean of the diplomatic corps. And many looked to her for advice, recommendations. She was, of course, definitely to be reckoned with then. And I'll also continue to say even now. So we're very privileged to have her indeed for the Future of Diplomacy Project, this particular event. And we're very excited for those of you who are with us today in person and those of you who are with us online. There's one caveat that I want to put forward, and that is she's here in her personal capacity. Although she serves and consults and advises the foreign ministry, just to be clear that her positions that she will present that she's presenting in her own personal capacity. I think that's an important uh, point to make, uh, uh, you know, that distinction because official governments do take these things very seriously. And, and you're very open to take this conversation in any direction you want. So we're looking forward to that. Well, I'm gonna dive right in. And the question I wanna dive right in on first and foremost is about Ukraine. You know, we read a lot about Ukraine, we know what the US position is in the debates, we know what Europe is saying and back and forth, but you know what? We really haven't heard the perspective from Asia. So welcome to you and over to you. We're looking forward to hearing your perspective, starting with that question from Asia. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah. Is this on the mic? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. It's good to be back here. It is many years now. And the pandemic is only one of the reasons. Um, I want to make a correction. I was never dean of the foreign mm -hmm. diplomatic corps. I was almost dean. <laughs> <laughs> we all thought you were dean. Maybe <laughs> yeah. that's more important. Chibuti was always there before me. <laughs> and he was dean in the UN and he was dean in Washington. And it's funny, he never wanted to take up uh, the duties 
when it was raining more slowly. <laughs> and I was very little, I was standing there with an umbrella with the state visits, you know, and the uh, presidents and prime ministers of countries who was who were on a state visit would come to the White House. And there I was. But uh, it's been great to serve. So, so you were were virtually doing but when they come to Ukraine and Southeast Asia, I'm chair of the Institute of Southeast Asia, Kusoptish Isha Institute. Every year since 2019, we do a state of Southeast Asia survey. Good reference for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and we monitor the elite opinion. They are the elite and uh, people who work in uh, the government departments, particularly security departments, we know a lot of the business, uh, media, uh, think tanks, other think tanks, and business sectors. So it's really important. In about November, when the last survey was taken, end of November, the top three concerns of Southeast Asians were, one, the pandemic and how it will follow its course. Physically, in terms of health, how long is this going to take and how does it end? Much like what we're thinking about Ukraine. Now. Two, jobs and employment linked to the pandemic. And the third concern, interestingly, is climate change. Nobody talked about big power competition, Sino Soviet competition, or, you know, Russia was not even in the picture. So that is the mind of Southeast Asia at the beginning of the year 2022. Boom, comes February 24, and the invasion of Ukraine. I think for those of us who watch carefully, it's a gray swarm. But not many people in Southeast Asia watch it so closely. But let me point out that in Southeast Asia, of the 10 countries, and you know the Southeast Asian countries, um, Vietnam and Laos abstained in the UN resolution. Uh, Singapore was a country that went the whole, you know, sort of blanks. We voted, you know, for the UN resolution and imposed sanctions. The only country in Southeast Asia to do so. The other countries voted for the resolution, but interestingly, when you look at the statements they make, um, I remember it was uh, Indonesia, Brunei, and the Philippines condemned the action, but did not name <clears throat> Russia. Then you have Malaysia, Cambodia, and uh, what was the last country that I was? Thailand, who expressed concern about what had happened. Didn't condemn, expressed concern and did not name <clears throat> Russia. So you have varying positions, you know. So if you ask me, do Southeast Asians look on the Ukraine war in the same way as the West? No. They think it's terrible. Singapore took a very strong position because we believe that the UN Charter is, you know, cannot be violated. Big country cannot be a small country. We're a small country. We've taken a strong stance at every instance when a big country invaded a small country, including when America invaded Grenada. We also took a strong stance at the UN. Kuwait, Vietnam, you know, all the time. But in the Southeast Asia, you have to understand that Vietnam and Laos, for instance, they have strong links with Russia, socialist system, communist system, and that elites are educated in Russia. So, and in fact, even up to 2020, 2018, Russia was trying to start a base in Laos. And in 2020, they went and helped Laos remove the ordinance, military ordinance from the Vietnam War from the field. So they have relationships with Russia. Now, so that's Vietnam or Laos. But the other countries, do you know that Russia? is a major supplier of weapons, equipment, to Southeast Asia. 80% of Vietnam's military equipment comes from Russia. Russia supplies to every country in Southeast Asia military equipment, except Singapore doesn't buy, except for Singapore. 
we don't buy from the We buy a bird. <laughs> and we love them all before. And oh, we do buy Swedish, French. Uh, but uh, I think it's the military equipment. Why? The price is right. That's why. Conditionality probably is not so onerous. And some have suggested that some of the countries want to show that they are neutral. And they are not buying American equipment, they're not buying Chinese equipment, so they buy Russian equipment. Mm -hmm. Whatever, but it's a major art supply. And for, for Indonesia, it's a very major art supply. And energy, food, also a major issue. 16% of the wheat that the Philippines consumes comes from Russia. You know, of course, you can always find alternatives, but you know, it's a bit of a, it's, a, it's harder and maybe you have to pay more. And so, uh, in other words, there's been a long history of engagement with Russia. And by the way, Malaysia, Philippines, Indonesia, they all have joint venture operations with Russia to build energy projects. And it's still there. They wonder what's going to happen to it. So you will find them, countries in Southeast Asia are a bit cautious about what is happening. Uh, my friend Dino Jalal from Indonesia, who, run, who was ambassador at the UN, uh, sorry, at, in Washington, and he runs the sort of the Council of Foreign Relations in Indonesia. He said that, oh, people are talking a lot about the Ukraine war now. Why? Because of the food crisis, energy crisis, as well. And they're all for Russia, you know, because they feel that, you know, NATO didn't have to expand, it expanded, and as a result, uh, Russia fell through. So you will find that, and I am told that in India, by an Indian journalist, that uh, in the Lok Sabha, the lower house, every MP who stood up to speak spoke for Russia, understanding Russia. Okay, so I'm trying to give you a different perspective <coughs> from how the world looks at the, the issue. I am not justifying <coughs> Russia's invasion to, to, uh, of Ukraine. I am simply giving you the facts of the uh, situation. And in Singapore, I have to explain why we were right in, by the way, in Singapore. Singapore said, yeah, we understand you could get the action, but why must you impose sanctions? And I've been giving talks, panels, and so on, and explaining why we are following the sanctions with other like minded countries. In your view, do you think that given what you have just stated about the perspective of Southeast Asia, can any diplomatic overtures by the United States or by other countries in the West, can they have an impact in changing the minds of the Southeast Asia countries that have been very pro-Russian? Uh, it will be, of course, you can always change people's minds. Narratives are important. Uh, but the, and there are, by the way, in Southeast Asia, there are competing narratives, a war of narratives. It is amazing, you know, in Singapore, and I'm sure elsewhere too, I am flooded by narratives, you know, and some of the narratives seem to come from China, Mexico, anger of the United States, you know, but actually some of them are straight, I think, Russian, but using some other proxies, you know. The narratives are there and they're just flooding the space. So, uh, if you want to do something about changing the perceptions, it will take time. Changing narratives require time, and you must be skillful and smart about it. You know, so sure, you can always do it, but uh, you know, there's a history, and you've got to take years in undoing the history. Whereas, engagement, forgive me for saying this, sir. Uh, Paula, with uh, Southeast Asia by American administrations, the word I would use is episode. Well, let, let's go to China uh, because it, there's been a lot of focus on whether China should be playing a more active and engaged role. Some have characterized China as taking a very balanced view vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, and uh, especially vis-a-vis -vis Russia's aggressive actions in Ukraine. 
Some have characterized it actually as uh, being totally in the camp of Russia. What is the view from within Asia itself as to what China's position is regarding Russia's uh, aggression in Ukraine? And uh, what, uh, how do people perceive it? You know, uh, in my region, depending on which countries you speak to, uh, you know, I had a distinct delegation of uh, legislators from a major Southeast Asian country, I won't say which countries. And the question we asked was this is the foreign relations committee. It's a, it's, the question was why has America changed its view about China? Why is it so, why is Taiwan so volatile? You know, there's a lack of understanding, but these are fairly senior people, you know, so you come back to something very basic. How do we perceive China? Now, we all know that China and uh, President Xi and President Putin did meet at the Winter Olympics and his famous words, no limits, you know, partnership or friendship came about. And that has been the albatross around China's neck. And they have to explain this. If you ask me, uh, Paula, I'm a diplomat, you're a diplomat. We've been at summits, Gary, you know. We've been at summits with leaders. You know, they don't say, hey, Joe, you know, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. Do you think Clinton will say, hey, see, I'm going to do this and do that? And uh, say, so very good, go ahead. <laughs> you will not speak it that way. Plus, you're speaking in different languages. Imagine that Russian and Mandarin, and it's got to be interpreted. And leaders always, even if they speak the same language in English, it would be a bit elliptical unless you have strategic trust and you are like this together. I would say Britain and the US, probably kissing cousins, you know, cousins across the pond, you will have, in fact, a quite close relationship. But by and large, leaders speak elliptically. They do not speak directly. And it's unlikely, I feel, that, you know, Putin would have said uh, very, been very explicit about what he would do. If I had to imagine it, and I'm told it happened uh, during uh, when Carter met Deng Xiaoping, uh, Deng Xiaoping said in Vietnam, this was just before the Vietnam War, uh, when China entered Vietnam, you know, are doing this with the Soviet Union. It cannot be, it cannot be tolerated. I have to do something. That's all. Okay. And apparently, you can double check. I just heard it in speaking to one of the seasoned American diplomats. He said, and Carter said, we understand. That's it. <clears throat> now, did Putin, and I'm imagining, and it's plausible, did Putin said, NATO is expanding near my borders and is a threat to Russia. I have to do something. And Xi Jinping may, may have nodded. Okay. <laughs> now, I said this in Washington, and in Washington, people said, but didn't they see we showed satellite photographs, mark, troops amassed? I said, you know, since the said, you amass force, never to use it. You just threaten and you hope you end up negotiating. In fact, I would say in much of Southeast Asia, most of us said, surely they will come to a compromise. This threatening, threatening. And I think Europeans all thought to that, that they'll find some solution. So, okay. And maybe, and I'm just guessing here, Xi Jinping may have thought, okay, they'll do what they did in Crimea or Donbass, quick, easy out. I think myself that China was quite shocked at what happened. And you have Bill Burns, Janet Yellen, Jake Sullivan, all three of your senior security people who said China has not violated the sanctions. It has not done anything to sell any weapon equipment, so much so that uh, Russia has to go to you know Iran, North Korea, Turkey, I don't know, to get stuff, you know. So I don't think it is fair to say China actually is in cahoots with uh, uh, 
of Russia. And I know I was reading this stuff. When February 22nd, around the February to uh, you know, early weeks, people thought, Americans thought that China would rush to Taiwan and they had to stop it. And I said, don't be silly. China has its own timetable. Why would they be pushed by uh, Russia? And they cannot afford a any conflict because first the pandemic is raging, the economy is doing so badly, and there's the important 20th Party Congress, which is this weekend. They don't want anything to upset that. Uh, President Xi is going for a third term. Why would they want that to be? Why would they go for Taiwan now? You know. So, but I think in the United States, there were segments who thought it's going to happen now, it's going to happen now. It won't, you know, and it will take a while. You know? So, and in the region, nobody thought it was going to happen. There was calm, you know, all the excitement was on in the West. But, yeah. there's, a, but there's a different question now. And yes. It's not about the timetable, but it's about how we handle Ukraine, and some will argue. How we handle Ukraine will send a signal to China and will impact uh, potential aggression by China vis a vis Taiwan. How, how would you respond to that? I think Ukraine carries lessons for China. I think, you know, and I'm saying nothing original, American strategic, strategic thinkers have quote boxes. Um, China was first, uh, must have first noticed that. Wow, you know, the Russian humanity didn't do so well. Two, the intelligence must have been very poor. You know, and three, must have been shocked by the immediate unity of uh, the West with the United States. And maybe Putin banged on Europe not being able to be the United States. All right. So that is completely wrong. And that's changed the you world. Know? The United States and Europe is very much together, and President Biden has done very well on the foreign policy front on that. And galvanizing countries to come with a very strong package of sanctions. Not every country, sorts of the world, Latin America, Africa, South Asia, and Southeast Asia, all of them did not impose sanctions, but the most important economies that matter did. And that's the problem. You know, he must have noticed that. That's and that would have taught something. And so I think it's mostly the sanctions, how strictly the financial sanctions came about. And also every country thought we had reserves. I bet you Saudi Arabia set up, Japan set up, China set up. What well, you can have reserves, but if swift blocks and if the banks are sanctioned, what's that? So I think, yes, there were lessons, you know. I noticed this, but it's not written up. I thought since the invasion of Ukraine, in recent um, periods, after the OMC visit, and around then, China issued a white paper on Taiwan, there was more emphasis on resolution by peaceful means. You know, at the 19th Party Congress and just after that, I thought, uh, using force was, you know, higher up on the agenda. Here is, of course, force is on the table. We don't want to take force off the table. But, but you know, we will try every means to do this peacefully. And I went somewhere, and I'm trying to pick up this statement again. I'm going to read so much. That uh, they, uh, I thought I saw this from a Chinese book, senior person who said, of course, when we talk of one China, there are many forms of interpretation of one China. We can be as creative as we want. It seems to me China really just wants China. Please say, please say one China, then you can keep your system. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the Taiwanese now have a strong sense of the latest poll. 70% of Taiwanese say they feel the Taiwan identity. You know. So, and recently, um, uh, China went at the double ten uh, celebrations, and we don't want war. Nobody wants war. The countries will go to war. So I think in the Asian constraints, you know, my sense is the United States doesn't want war on Taiwan. China doesn't want war on Taiwan. Taiwan doesn't want war on Taiwan. 
you know, but uh, there's a lot of talk and talking up about the war on Taiwan by the newspapers, by people on panels and talking heads and so on. Let's go to India. I know we're focused on Southeast Asia, right. but it would be really good to get your perspective on India because India is an unusual case when you look at how India has responded to uh, Russian aggression in, in Ukraine. Um, explain to us, what is India doing? How would you characterize it? Because you know that India has basically taken a position uh, basically stepping aside, not condemning uh, uh, Russia. And more significantly, it continues getting its arms sales. By the way, you mentioned about Vietnam and the 80%. India, actually, its number one arms supplier happens to be Russia. By the way, U.S. is second. And then and then the other issue is about the issue of energy. That's correct. And, and so there are some in the United States who will say, despite it being a strategic partner, we should impose secondary sections on India. So first, explain what is India doing, in your opinion, that takes a different position, usually in the context of the Indo Pacific. And then also, you know, how best should we be dealing with India in this context? Let me first think about what are sanctions. <coughs> when I was in Washington, I always thought sanctions was really, you have to use it, but don't use it too quickly. It doesn't work. And you bring a lot of unintended consequences. You know, it's sort of showing how moral you are. You come stamp your foot, then you run off. So, <laughs> so yeah, and uh, so it's uh, and you know, poor countries that are of no strategic value, like Myanmar, get the sanctions all the time. You know, if it's a country of strategic value, you throw sanctions, away, <laughs> which is not fair. So, but uh, India is interesting. By the way, I see India as a mixed rising power. You know, it is a mixed rising power, but there are a lot of internal problems. Some people think it's an internal problems to draw it back, but you know, the numbers take it. You know, when you have the numbers, the market, the energy, you will move forward. So, you should, I'm sure you have all looked Jai Shankar's YouTubes, they're very interesting. You know. And what did he say? India is in nobody's camp. And India has 1.4 billion people. What side should I take? I take the side of India. All right. Uh, how do I see India? Again, it's the history and the tradition with association with, uh, with uh, Russia, Soviet Union. You know, Singapore and the ASEAN countries fought India because India sided Vietnam in the invasion of Cambodia. It was Soviet Union, India, and Vietnam together. So we've been, you know, it's been on a, a different kind of policy. Pre, Pre, Prime Minister Modi is different. He's the one who swung India more towards the United States, and the United States, since Clinton, Bush, and so on, decided to pay India more attention and bring India into the American camp. India is a member of court. The quad, good luck, you know. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, and uh, I think it will be its own person, will play its own, uh, it has its own interests in this way. And I think the, uh, but India is now. President Modi sees a different path forward. If China is growing stronger, is a challenge. So it's trying to balance out much more than it was before. Before, you know, they were not aligned, and since Nehru's period, they are not aligned. And that runs deep in Indonesia. In India, by the way, in Indonesia too, these are all the non-aligned, non-aligned countries, leaders. So it's deep there, you know. So India now is in the fort, but it reserves its right to do what it wants, which tells me actually today, countries are not non-aligned. They are multi-aligned. And what does multi-alignment mean? I'll align with you, the United States for the court, but don't count on me being only you know, in one faithful alignment. I can be multi-aligned. With others, I'll align with others on another issue. 
So to me, that's the trend the world is taking. I have been writing about this for one as in Singapore newspapers and this. And I talked of the pop-up world order, which has come up since uh, in the Cold War. Two sides, the United States and the West and its treaty allies, and uh, China and Russia on the other, and the rest of the countries in the world. Big countries, small countries, Brazil, Argentina, India, they want to belong to a third space. Not the West and not Russia or the Soviet Union. But it doesn't mean they will never align with either side on some things, but it means you can change. And that's the way it is. And you can have multi alignments at the same time on different issues. I think that's where we are trending. You are quite right. There are, when I think about it, quite a few alliances, so I'll use that word, or alignments uh, in Asia itself because you have the quadrilateral security dialogue as you reference the quad, but you also have the United States, uh, Japan, Australia. Then you have AUKUS, which came up, but then you also have Australia, Indonesia, and India. You mentioned Indonesia. So it's, you know, different uh, alignments have arisen for tar more targeted purposes. Right, but I would count the AUKUS uh, alliance, you know, almost the same as the Ukraine alliance, aligning with the West. It's true. Because they are three Anglo-Saxon countries. True. They didn't even know about the French. It's your five eyes. They're Anglo-Saxon. Really strategic trust and language, culture, and matters. Five eyes, Anglo-Saxon. All right? So August is three eyes coming together. But what is multi-alignment is this. Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Korea, they are in reset. It's um, economic grouping, but they take the same side as the United States on uh, Ukraine, on you know, some of the major mm -hmm. alliances, and Japan is a quad as well. I, I have a quick comment, but I want all of you to be thinking about your question. I have one more question for the ambassador and let's go to you and also for those tuning in online. But a quick comment because you mentioned the quad. Actually, there's also a real practicality because after I'd say the real uh, uh, heat of the pandemic and the challenge to supply chains and particularly the issues relevant to China and supply chains, Many of the countries banded together and in the context of the Quad, there was a Quad meeting, not military, but the meeting expanded to include South Korea, Vietnam, and New Zealand. And specifically, they came together to talk about manufacturing and how do we bypass China because China really impacted those supply chains and getting some of the health equipment. So there's some creative thinking and some positive thinking going on, but not just only in the Western mode. I wanted yeah. to say, which I think has, has emerged. Let me ask you one last question. I want to go to all of you. Just how do you see the relationship between Russia and China? You know, that's another area that's debated quite a bit in the Midwest. Some will say, oh, it's just a marriage of convenience. Some will say, no, it's an alliance. And the terminology that has even been used by both Putin and Xi. But some just cast it as an alignment where some interests converge, but otherwise they diverge. Actually, um, in Singapore, in my part of the world, we remember the Sino-Soviet history very well. That is deep enmity. Okay, that was ideological. But Russia and China share the same border. And, uh, you know, the VRI of China which is going across the stands cannot be viewed very happily by the Soviet, by Russia, because you are trampling in my backyard and competing. But right now, I think that Russia, Russia and China find themselves, you know, it's useful to be together because the United States is rallying Western countries against autocracies. You know, and we can talk about that. The question can come from the floor. <laughs> um, the, uh, so I think right now they are together because you know they are you know they are the best allies. They don't have any other. 
you know. So uh, they're together, but recently you would have heard at the meeting in Uzbekistan that uh, Russia met uh, Modi and he met Sitting. And um, someone said, you know, Modi went up with his chest, pressed on his chest, and said, you know, this is not an era of war. I'm not sure he did that. He must have said, right, you know, President, this is not an era of war. <laughs> <laughs> But um, Xi Jinping did issue a statement. The Chinese never issued a statement. And people said, why did Putin say that? Why did Putin issue the statement to say, yes, we understand your concern? And Ian Bremer, who runs uh, you know, a Kazakh yeah, yeah. Eurasian group, said in one of his newsletters, he spoke to the delegation members of both China and India. And in fact, far more was said in the meeting. They expressed far stronger views than was expressed. Now, why did China not say anything? I think this is very Chinese, if I may say so. I'm a Singaporean of Chinese descent, so I kind of understand that culture. Probably Xi Jinping said, you know, we are allies. You know, we have this ally alliance relationship. Better it comes from you than me. If I'm saying this in public, I'm rebuking you. But you say, and I want you to show, because he's concerned about the public image of China too, that you have to tell the world that I raised these concerns with you. And I'm sure they must have raised nuclear, don't do nuclear, because you're on your own. And like, when is this going to stop? When are you going to talk? You know, it can't go on like this. Because don't forget, China has a strong relationship with Ukraine too. You know, China grows its food in Ukraine. They have leased land in Ukraine. And uh, you know, people said that the Chinese must have known. If they had known, would they have left some 6,000 Chinese in Ukraine, students and so on? They didn't know, they didn't expect the war to actually happen in that way. That's why I don't think, you know, as some Americans do, especially those who are very really tough on China. Uh, I don't think that they really knew it would go this far, mm -hmm. you see? So I think China must have expressed this, but the formulation was better you say it than I say it, because you know, I'm rebuking you. That's very Chinese. So, uh, yeah. so I think that's how we have it. Well, let's take some questions from the floor. Okay, why don't we go right here? And if you don't mind, speak loud and introduce yourself. And yeah, we, tell me what you study. Right. Oh, okay. Exactly. Uh, well, first of all, like Ambassador Chen, Ambassador Gobian, thank you mm -hmm. so much for this wonderful event. Um, my name is Sama Kuba. I'm a junior at Harvard College. And um, I'm actually a current foreign service intern with the Department of State. So really inspiring to see two amazing ambassadors um, uh, today. I wanted to follow up, uh, Ambassador Chen, on um, your discussion um, on India trying to counterbalance like China's influence. Um, I wanted to ask you um, about, you know, like if South, if there are other Southeast Asian countries also feeling that way. I've been reading reports about Southeast Asian countries um, trying to flex like military might, even some European countries coming in there trying to flex military might to counter China in, um, in the region. But I just wanted to ask if you see a parallel between like how India is feeling and between how some other Southeast Asian countries are feeling about China's presence. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Um, you know, China has been growing, you know, remarkably relentlessly. Now it's run into a bad patch. And I think economic growth will go to the few years to recover. Property crash, all kinds of things. And zero COVID policy is a real problem on for economic growth. So uh, maybe there is less anxiety. There's a lot of talk about the growing military capability of China. I think China's capability is growing. Don't forget that naval capability ability was zero, you know, Gary knows that. They're rushing to keep up. And actually, I think they, they're nowhere near the United States, all right? Maybe, you know, it's more than India, you know? But uh, countries hedge, yes, surely they do. 
they hedge against China, they hedge against the US too. Is the US a reliable partner? Okay, but they are they're worried about China. But is the United States a reliable partner? Are you going to be around? You know, are you going to withdraw? Because you had President Trump who said uh, America first. Uh, you know, they, and the message was they will not he will not take part in optional wars anymore. And even President Obama was going to choose the wars. It's not like President Bush who went into I think that our withdrawal from Afghanistan yes, uh, also had a bad impact on this issue That's of predictability. Right. So the hedging is both ways. Oh. I'm going to go back here and we'll try to get everybody. Yes, yes, if you, yes, you. If uh, you uh, please uh, introduce yourself. Good afternoon. I'm Alwin. I'm from Indonesia. I went to PSU I want to ask what's the chance or the possibility mm -hmm. of both Putin and Zelensky attending the G20 summit in Bali next month? Um, well, I just saw, was it a YouTube? Yes, reporting some news that Lavrov then taught a message that if uh, President uh, Biden would like to talk to uh, President Putin, they are up for something. I'm paraphrasing very bad, but it was more subtly, you know, because you don't want to give too much away and you don't want to sound like you're asking for a meeting. A meeting is possible or something. So, looks like Putin will go. Zelensky, harder because the war is on, he may zoom in, you know, which is how he's been participating in meetings, yeah? including here at Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, I, I think that. You know, there's a chance Putin might do that, but uh, Zelensky is harder. Yeah. Uh, let's go to the back and we'll definitely try to catch everybody. Yes, she please. Had her hand. I know, I know. I'm going to come to her next. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm trying to do it geographically. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Please. Thank you very much. Um, Harry Wong from China, and currently studying national and FBI with Ben FBS. I do view as the sort of political revolution more aligned in China and US relations. Uh, my question is about how would the uh, China's economic problem that's being experienced right now uh, affecting the and South Asian perception of China and also the China economic relationship? Because I have a lot of friends now in China relocating to Singapore. Singapore's economy actually rising and also because the Chinese rising with the high uh, rise of property prices and uh, uh, other influences as well. And this is a two question of, of which very naturally uh, the party Congress is very near is that how the South Asian countries, and especially Singapore, sees uh, about the potential outcomes of the 20th party Congress on um, uh, the future of the relationship with China and the relationship with our countries. Well, there are many questions. <laughs> <laughs> Pick up two. One is how do the prestige the economic downturn of uh, China and the society region see that? I think uh, if the countries are watching with uh, surprise and just wondering when COVID zero is going to end. Now, many countries in Southeast Asia seem to believe that once China ends COVID zero, things will move up again, you know. And so in the long run, China's growth past is still up, but it sort of goes back to the space of places and two steps and goes forward. So is COVID zero? That's what they think, you know, and it will just take time to work it out. All right. So that's one reading of it. In the short term, actually, the problems between US and China, the competition, has benefited Southeast Asia. Uh, Vietnam is getting a lot of the redirected investment supply chains. You know. uh, Indonesia is getting some of it, Bangladesh. You know. uh, Singapore is the, we are headquarters. And because of COVID and how we've handled it, I know we were criticized, but everybody looks, hey, I'd rather have COVID in Singapore than anywhere else. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, it, you know, and uh, so. People have been coming now. For us, it's going to be a political issue because prices are going up and so on. And I can just see it a couple of years later when we have our general elections, unless this is tempered, that it will, the opposition will take this up as an issue. You know. 
but uh, I think we we are all looking forward to the end of COVID zero in China. Yeah. As for the results of the twentieth uh, party congress, um, let me put it this way: I see President Xi Jinping as shaping his version of Chinese capitalism today. Deng Xiaoping came up with his version of Chinese capitalism. White cat, black cat, whatever can catch mice, you know. <laughs> what is that uh, thing on Wall Street that is okay to be to get rich in this whatever, yeah. Yeah. you know? Now, so it was no holds bar yeah. during the Xiaoping period. Same with Jiang Zemin, same with Hu Jintao. Comes uh, Xi Jinping to see what's happening, 1%, 99%, he's saying, I don't want a Jeff based Chinese version of Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk. You can do what you want, but you cannot do that. You cannot be Bill Gates and so on. And I think it is about the party control. You cannot have power centers unto themselves, these tech giants. So he's trying to bring all that down, but it's done so rapidly and so bluntly that it shocked everybody and brought all the markets down. You know, so that's what's happened. And he seems to believe in, he believes in common prosperity, but with such fervor, you know, it's a Scandinavian type of social democratism, mm -hmm. but when it's a Chinese version, it's really, you know, a very tight. Set. So it's shocked everybody. So common prosperity has been a return to Marxism. <clears throat> and I know Kevin Rudd has been saying this. He's the president of Asia Society. I'm the co chair. So, you know, he says that uh, <clears throat> President Xi Jinping is far more Marxist and Leninist. Marxist and socialism, Leninist in organization, tighter. So he's tight in that. But they still want the market. They still want to, they still embrace the market, but with these stipulations. So, if you ask me, Xi Jinping wants to bring about capitalism with Chinese characteristics. And you know, so you can get rich, but not so rich. And you cannot get richer than the state. State cannot must be able to control you, you know, and there must be common prosperity. But the way it is done is upset a lot of people and it's very drastic. Suddenly, all the education apps, you know, private tuition apps are taken off the market. It's stuff like that, you see. So anyway, uh, that's China. What will happen with the party changeover? You know, everybody's reading tea leaves and I'm reading all the gossip blogs. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm watching to see um, who comes in. And if the premier is Hu Jinhua, he seems to be more of a reformist and that's a compromise with the, the loose uh, actions. So let's see the balance of market, pro market, reform people, and the you know, tighter policy. Yeah, but now let's come to you. Well, thank you for your patience. I'll try and get it to you. Yeah. Literally. Thank you very Please. much, both ambassadors. Uh, my name is Melissa Zhang, and I'm a, a Hong Konger born in Sichuan, China. Uh, I'm a Stanford MBA and HKS MPA student. Um, so I have one and a half questions. So the first one <laughs> is, uh, one of my greatest concerns having lived in the US for the last decade is just seeing the level of polarization both across the country and in DC. I'm curious from your time in DC, um, could you please comment on the way uh, both parties have united against China and whether that truly is a race to the bottom in current deteriorating relationships I and mean, for personal political interest. And then secondly, as an Asian who's considering a future career in diplomacy, uh, what are some subjects you might encourage us to study now so that we are best prepared for a career in 20 years from now? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, thank you for the question. The, uh, you know, when I was in Washington, I met in July 2012. You know, I was lunching with Gary and Wendy for dinner and Paula. I thought towards 2012, 2011, 2012, maybe 2010 it started, but certainly 2011, it was very hard for me to go dinner parties and invite Republicans and Democrats together. <laughs> you know, I have to do very difficult, very well. I did that until 2011, but then I have to be careful. I ran what people call salons. 
at the salon dinners. So it was like a very fancy seminar dinner. <laughs> but you have to wait three people well to get good dinner for you. <laughs> That's another thing. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so you've got to the moderates because if you get them from the two wings, it's very hard to get conversation flow. Uh, and that happens to change. And for China, unfortunately for China, the two sides will you know, have uh, Democrats and Republicans can only agree on one thing, and that is bash China. <laughs> and in a way, China didn't help itself. You know, uh, I think they lost the support of all the uh, business. And they should have offered more market access, for instance, in less unpredictable. I mean, all this China could have done, but did not, you know. So it was a developing country when it joined WTO. It is still a developing country, but at the coast and in certain cities, it is a developed country. So how do you moderate that, you see? And before they lost all the support of business people, and they've done that now. And what worries me about what's happening in uh, the United States, sometimes when I speak to people, there seems to be almost a shrill sort of quality in the anger of China. I don't want to use the word hate, it's too strong, but they are so angry with China, you know. So I wonder why, you know, pull it back, reel it in, you know. The, and imagining China to be something. China doesn't, that China's made a lot of mistakes you know, and it's not an angel, but uh, I don't think it deserves to be demonized, all right? Today, I look at the newspaper, I subscribe to Financial Times and the New York Times. So I get hard copies every day, I do it over breakfast. And I open the papers and I say, now what has China done wrong today? <laughs> <laughs> okay, is it, China? is it, you know, uh, really being very tough on the, you see how badly how they treat the Olympic uh, people, you know, this torture, the training and so on. I mean, every day there's something, the poverty and this and that and that. You mean other countries don't have it? Why are the stories there? Why is it all about China and all this? And during the pandemic, and I've made this observation during SARS, all the countries in the world came together and we beat SARS, they collaborated and they said what they would do for them. Over COVID, what was said, you know, is it the authoritarian system that's called? producing this. They were trying to blame it on the authoritarian communist system. Hey, how about getting vaccines together and helping people who are sick? You know, so and it's not like we knew a lot about COVID, you know, everybody panicked when it happened. You know, I just saw a report. It is in Lancet, which is a British medical journal of an Australian virologist who worked in Singapore in the Duke and US uh, medical college in Singapore, but it's been all over US, France, Cambridge. She said she worked in the Wuhan lab and all these accusations, she's a bit astounded. She said they, as far as she knew, nobody was producing any virus. You know, they were trying to understand the behavior of the virus, yes. But, uh, and she said, we took all the protocols and suddenly she finds that they're in the middle of this controversy. She said, I was there. You know, so I, it's a very lengthy piece and I just read it. So, you know, he said, but nobody wants to hear this now. Uh, the second part of the question about being a good diplomat. What do you have to do to be a good diplomat? Um, I think whatever you say, people's skills are very important. Diplomat. It's not the subjects. Oh no, you are smart. You can do any project. Do you know? We sent two vets to China as our uh, ambassadors in China. They were very good ambassadors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what I'm trying to say is that your profession, the subject you do, can help, but it's not crucial. It's you, your personality. Are you a people person? Secondly, I define diplomacy 
as political entrepreneurship. Okay. It's uh, you have to take initiative. You have to do things that make things happen. That's what diplomats do. Where otherwise it would not happen. So you've got to have that initiative. Okay. And now you have to deal with new technology. You know how you work with it. How do you reach out? And constantly is about outreach. About you were asking me how do you convince the uh, Southeast Asians that, you know, there's the American narrative and so on. So it's always about reaching out. And you've got to, you have to keep up with the technology, you know, but don't trust technology only. You know, when people tell me, you know, I sit on the Social Science Research Council, I'm the deputy chairman in Singapore, and we have projects where, you know, the uh, proposal says, they want to use algorithms, big data to understand Chinese leadership and who's going to come out with the leader, what schools they went, etc. I said the last mile is the hardest. And you can't predict what happens in the last mile, no matter what your data is, you know, and how do you do that? I think it's good to also have a few languages. Yeah. <laughs> Erica. Online, do we have a number of people who no, we don't? Okay, so I'm going to you over here if you introduce yourself. Yes, we'll go on this side. We're going to try, I think we're going to take two here, and there was another person there. Go ahead. Thank you, Marisa. Uh, I have a few questions from India. Two questions by the I'm sorry. Uh, one is uh, what is the lot of talk about you know, getting the same and that share back under the table? But could, uh, could you have got a region called themselves in a way where his leadership is not associated with the war? So, what exit strategy can we give him so that when comes to the table, he does not seriously compromise his um, viability in Russia? That is one. Another one just comes from the area. China is a massive land, like geographically, it's a vast country. So is India. So is India. <laughs> yes, uh, we are engaged in. Um, like India, USA, China, India, three massive different budgets. And we're all engaged in fights over narrow tracts of land. And India basically has maybe one with uh, China and Pakistan, but China has like, multiple neighbors in the region. So there is really an opportunity for an occidental rise. And so what we're seeing is that China and India, the US and UK of this age, uh, age are just constantly counterbalancing each other. Was there any point at which this relationship could have been salvaged? Is it still possible, or are you looking at doing either one or the other? Uh, would you mind if I take one more over here? I think someone, yes, go ahead. Thank you very much, Madam Ambassador. This was a wonderful conversation. Um, my name is Jam, NPT student here. One question that I had was about Singapore's relationship with the other Southeast Asian nations, particularly after Singapore was the only one to install the sanctions against Russia. Has that um, you know, alienated Singapore from the rest of the Southeast Asian community, or has that brought the world together? Thank you. So, if you want to work backwards, Singapore's yeah. relationship oh, and impact, and then we'll go to her question. Um, you know, in my region, everybody is consuming their own problems. They're not so, they yeah. don't care that much about what position Singapore takes vis a vis Russia and whether we do sanctions. Malaysia is going to have an election, it's internal. Uh, elite struggles. So is uh, Thailand. You know, Prayu is just fighting <laughs> to constitutionally remain in power. And Indonesia is preparing for the presidential elections in 2024. They are concerned about food, they are concerned about rising energy prices, and so on. And everybody is worried about the pandemic and the cost, you know. And they are worried about the Ukraine war and how long this is going to go on for because they pay so much for energy and food. And so that's their main concern. It hasn't alienated them from Singapore. But I think what is bothering some is that they see so many new companies and the wealthy coming to Singapore to uh, make Singapore the home. And they feel, wow, you must be. They know you're doing very well, and why you, not, not me. Yeah. Uh, so that is, you know, but we've always had to deal with this problem that um, the, because we stand out in the region in that way, so it's how do you 
team with it. You can't sort of pretend that like everybody in the region, why should you know? So we try to do uh, you know some assistance to regions, technical assistance to countries in the region, especially the Myanmar's, the Laos, the Cambodia's, and Vietnam's, and so on. But uh, still, and then over here was Russia exit yes. strategy, and then the second part, you know, is a little uh, is about a uh, China and UN, right. uh, and, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yes. So they have had a better relationship. One. Exit strategy, I think everybody's talking about that. You know, in the US, you talk about giving uh, the grant for Putin to become up. You know? I don't think anybody really knows it because they're all thinking about it. So I don't know how this is going to end, you know, to be quite frank. Some say that the best possibility is like Korea armistice. You don't declare the war over, but there's a moratorium. You stop it where it is and you draw the line. Where it is, you know, and we'll revisit the question later. One, uh, Putin might agree, but will uh, Zelensky, you know, they seem now to want to push the opportunity. But what lesson do we give the world? I think the Western regions are thinking about this too, because the idea is push back Russia on Ukraine because we, it cannot be demonstrated. That if you use force and just for whatever reason of your own march into some other country, you can just take some territory. That cannot be the lesson we keep. So if that's not the lesson, then you know, but then there's a practical part of it. You have to fight it. You know, so is the Korean armistice the best solution for you? you know? But how do you get them to the table? You know, if you're going to be a diplomat, there's some brutal facts you have to face, you know, like. People will not talk unless they have bled enough. I mean, to put it out, you know, they must have lost enough lives, bled enough, wasted enough treasure before they come to their senses as a country. So it took three years in Korea, so we're still got a long way to go. Yeah. yeah. Gabby had a question. So did you? I oh, maybe did you? Okay. okay. Well, no. I actually do have a question. All right. Let's First of all, I want to. And you have one. I want to thank the ambassador for sharing her wisdom with us. You. I want to follow up on uh, Putin's threat to use nuclear weapons, which has everybody a little nervous, because we're worried he might do something desperate if Russia continues to lose the war. I was really intrigued by your comment that you thought Xi Jinping had said something to warn Putin. Privately, not to use nuclear weapons, and I think it's really it's my... no, no. I, I I understand, but I think it's really important that non-Western countries make clear to the Russians privately that using nuclear weapons would really be a bridge too far. It would lead to Russia's political and economic isolation, and obviously, really important that China and India. Uh, and other big supporters of these are, are countries that are not taking a position to condemn Russia. It's really important that they deliver that message. So my question is whether you think Singapore and the other Southeast Asian countries can both deliver that message directly to the Russians in private and encourage other important countries like China to make sure Russia understands that nuclear use really would be a red line. And before, before you answer, let's take one more because we have a lot. I think you said yeah. you have one. Please introduce yourself. No, okay. Is that me? Sorry. Right. Yeah. Let's do ladies first. Go ahead. <laughs> and then we'll come to you. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm Alicia Shifaria. Uh, I'm also an FDP one. Uh, so I'm an Indian who grew up in Singapore, but it's been a real delight to be here. Uh, I had, again, one and a half question or so. Uh, one was around in, in kind of sphere of defense and security. Uh, curious to know how you feel like, of course, Singapore has compulsory NS. Uh, so how do you how do you see kind of the use of Singapore's readily kind of armed forces? Uh, is it still the kind of perceived vulnerability argument that we're just here, we're a small island in, in, in a in a large continent, and we're trying to kind of continually defend against any threats? Or do you feel like that's evolved? Um, and the second one was uh, on your point about India kind of multi aligning itself to many countries. Uh, would you say that having kind of too many target friends is equal to having a friend? <laughs> and the nuclear okay. question. Uh, uh, oh, I didn't think I did. Okay, 
so, so, so I think that was Gary's was uh, specifically you asked about the yeah the what could be done to warn the Russians privately yeah. against right. actually I think uh, the Ukraine war and the threat of using tactical nuclear weapons would have suddenly changed the conversation globally. You know, I mean, we haven't mentioned this for a long time. Suddenly, you're waving nuclear threats around. So that's what's new. And I think some of these Asians, if they haven't thought about this, should think about this a bit more serious. You know, and if they mean, and yeah, you know, um, Pyongyang, it was always North Korea firing the missile. And I remember going to a talk in school one day. Uh, these are like pre university students. And uh, this uh, student just asked very simply, you know, uh, Korea is, North Korea is firing these missiles out. Do you think it will, the missile will hit Singapore? Suddenly it dawned on these young kids, you know. So that was fair. You know, and he asked it in such a direct and naive way. I can see he's been thinking about it. So I would say yes, this new level of discussion that we have. Do we tell China? Why do I think China would have said that? Because it's like, no, Fred, once you go nuclear, there's nothing that I can do, you know? And please, you know, I don't really want to be dragged into that. And the whole world would be dragged into it. So, and I'm sure President Modi, Prime Minister Modi said the same thing, you know. Now, do we tell you them, uh, we don't, we don't meet Russian presidents every day. <laughs> in fact, it doesn't come around. And, uh, you know, if at G20, they meet, I'm sure people will be safe. But you are right, uh, Gary, it cannot be just Western leaders saying this to Putin. It's got to be global, you know, that, you know, hey, when you do your fights, just remember the rest of the world. You know? And I'm not sure it's being done in any future. Yeah. Yeah. And then the two questions, one was about Singapore's armed forces, and the other one was about your term multi-aligned India. Does that mean that they're multi-aligned, but they have no friends in the end? But I mean, Singapore's uh, policy is to make itself a poison shrimp. So that if you swallow us, attack us and swallow us, you die in the process. <laughs> a porcupine strategy. I see the word porcupine is now used for Taiwan. You may, you sort of arm the country to the extent that no one wants you to take it. And I suspect the US is looking at Singapore and using the same sort of uh, saying that look, this strategy worked for them, you know. And so that's what we are doing. And Singapore has always sort of bought expensive weapons and so on, and armed ourselves so that we will never have to use the weapons. And I think also Singapore has the mission building exercise. You know, Miss, I think you mentioned how do you make Singaporeans? And they, we all have the English language. That's the other thing. You can live anywhere, work anywhere. Why are you attached to Singapore? Because your home is Singapore. And in the end, you know, and others now are saying no room, no room. So you have to go back to see. <laughs> you know, so I would say that happens, but that's a simple strategy. In India, India multi-alignment. No I don't believe that multi-alignment means that if everybody is multi-aligned, you know, everybody's a friend of somebody. But you know, I come to you if I want this with you. I do not come to, I don't approach you on this particular issue because you missed it. You just learn to become more discerning in your relationships and to work with relationships. You get the last question. All right, we'll take, we'll take these two, but uh, one, one question, one question, <laughs> and we'll close with these two questions, please. Thank you both so much. My name is Rob Laxer. I'm an MVP student here from Montreal, Quebec. Um, I have a question about decision making. You mentioned the upcoming um, conference this weekend, and Xi Jinping has sort of been preparing, I think, I've been reading by consolidating power and diminishing the power of other decision making bodies within Chinese government. Do you think there are lessons to be learned from Russia and Ukraine where Putin has done something similar and the sycophants surrounding him haven't made his decisions and regrets without having 
more diverse voices or more distributed power. Do you think there are lessons that he's taking from this period as he looks towards his next term? Okay, and, and yours, if you would, 30 seconds. Who are you? Who are you? Oh, sorry. Hey, you can from South Korea and you can see the next uh, I see in the military domain kind of is expanding quite aggressively to kind of see building allies on the basis and stuff. Do you see a chance uh, of America returning to the Philippines, to the Bay, or the other places like Taiwan? Or do you think there's a chance that America will wait for the Philippines to cooperate with Thailand, Singapore, or Gala, et cetera, and the South Korea? Okay, great. Okay. Right. Uh, this is again about whether she actually is emulating. Oh, I don't think I so. Don't or has, think has lessons to take from what Putin did. Okay, but you asked about decision making. Yeah. Yeah. You know, China has its own web of relationships, and that is got a form of a piece of different factions. So it's not taking the Russian involved at all. Really. Because, you know, he's got the Jiangsu faction, the Yi faction. And there's a sitting in school, and he's been trying to balance the three factions. Gentleman is pretty old, but he has a so I think he has to work that. I meant more, um, you think he's going to increase the, the voices or the power of the other bodies as he is in his third and maybe final, perhaps not final term? Yeah, you, you are saying that because uh, Putin listens to only one voice, that therefore he's making it first. I don't think I'm going to like that. <laughs> 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 uh, um, no. <laughs> and then on the South China Seas, uh, the question was um, you know, the uh, I've been trying to understand the South China Sea, and uh, I the claims came around or filed around 2009 when the UN said, you know, we are going to draw. This is the final date for the claims for re diminution of boundaries mm. in America and boundaries. But before that, don't forget, it was the UTPP. I forget the year now, 2008, 2007, or earlier, when uh, the uh, Clinton, that was before, 1997, 1997, eight, when uh, the U.S. brought the aircraft carriers in the Straits. Oh, 96. 96. And China realized they could do nothing about it. You know, could move. You see, they can't get rid of it. So I think that's stuck in their mind. So as a result, they be, I think the South China Sea is a little about that. Do you think it's really about the planes and the, the petrol? It's a sort of all deposits and fossil. It's not. It's about really to me the route, the pathway for the US. You know, can the US sort of sail through with the carriers? They're just going to make it more difficult. Hence, you know, the claims in some China Sea <clears throat> to make it harder for the United States to send forces. It's about China. Okay, now, uh, to me, now, what is the uh, what is being done? For the South China Sea, a country like Singapore, we're not a claimant, but we are concerned about the freedom of navigation of seaways, which traditionally has been international, and we want to safeguard that. I think other countries who are not claimants do that too. There have been ongoing bilateral military uh, alliances, agreements between the United States and Singapore, Thailand. Thailand is a treaty ally. The Philippines is a treaty ally. We are not. You know. But every country does little things, even the nation with the US. Um, I do not think, but never say never, I do not think that the US will return to Subic Bay and Thailand. But I think they've done some things with it all, like shopping malls and so on. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, the relationship has become better. And uh, President Marcos Jr., the new uh, person, has said, has shown that he's not willing to get closer to the United States than on Turkey. Did. But then it also says we are good friends with China. So again, the balance and the budget is there. Um, I think every country is quietly sitting up and doing their own catch. 
yeah, and is strengthening the military uh, maritime defenses cooperation and so on. Not to go to war with anyone, but so that they would not be attacked or resent. Ambassador Chen, what a tour de force this afternoon. <laughs> really, you covered such a wide range of issues. We're honored to have you here at the Kennedy School in the Future of Diplomacy Project. Please join me in.